Okay, so here we are, uh, parallelism. <coughs> so I'm going to spare you um, uh, most of the uh, first five minutes of most talks about parallelism, about how we're stuck with multi cores. But uh, if you want to program a parallel computer, what are you going to do? This, uh, this goes back to the talk that I gave uh, yesterday a little bit. Would you rather start with a, uh, a language whose very fabric is by default sequential by mutating state or a language that's by default parallel? So uh, um, I think there's a case, to, a case for saying we should at least think about starting with by default parallel languages. And in fact, if you look, as I also mentioned uh, briefly a bit yesterday, quite a lot of the large scale successes in parallel programming have been to do with, uh, with um, setups that are, at least that their outer structure is very declarative or functional. There's not many um, side effects between different bits of SQL, say, in a, in a, in a big SQL query. So my, uh, my prediction for the future, to uh, uh, return to what you were saying, Amanda, is that, in the, that as far as programming large-scale parallel computations, that in the end, something declarative will win. Whether it will look like Haskell or not, I don't know, but it's going to be something declarative-like, I think, or functional-like. Um, but the flip side of the coin is I don't want to try to sell you a line that just says, well, if you write your program in Haskell, then suddenly we'll be able to run it, you know, scalably fast across a gigantic parallel computer. There is no parallelism without tiers. And what I'm about to describe is, is a kind of collection of approaches to parallelism, all of which fit in a, um, in a Haskell-like framework, but which don't claim to be, there's no one silver bullet to solve this problem. Um, in particular, you really have to think of a parallel algorithm. It's no use writing an algorithm whose data dependencies are sequential and expecting magically some lang language implementation to turn it into a parallel algorithm. There's no escape from creativity, which is a good thing, because if there was, we'd be out of a job as, as geeks. The other thing I just want to mention about um, parallelism by way of setting up is that I think there are different solutions to different problems. Concurrency is too variegated and complicated to be dealt with by a single mechanism or language paradigm or programming mechanism. So um, you know, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms we know about, like shared memory, um, uh, you know, locks and condition variables, or transactional memory, or message passing and stuff. They're good for different things. Um, and another thing that plays a key role is the cost model, right? If you're going to write a parallel program, you must have a notion of how expensive things are. So if you send a message to somebody, it makes a difference whether you think of that as swinging a pointer in a shared memory system or serializing the entire thing that you're sending and sending it to them. Do you, do you see what I mean? If you're um, programming a parallel computer, you may need to be very worried about locality. So your cost model gets sort of mixed up with the memory hierarchy as well. Um, and there are just lots of examples of these in, in the right-hand column here. I'm not going to pause here very long, just to um, remark that you know, it's kind of complicated. And in the end, I think this cost model stuff is too difficult to leave to the system. For example, in the olden days, we thought maybe we're going to have a big uh, computer with lots of distributed memory, and we'll implement some kind of distributed shared memory over it. So we'll give you the illusion of having a giant virtual address space across you know, a whole data center, and you can just randomly you know, access ad addresses everywhere. Um, you can't do that, because you can't hide the fact that some addresses are closer to you than others. And if you do try to hide it, then you just write slow programs. Right? So I think at the moment, we do not know how to hide the cost model and still get fast programs. In that case, you better expose it in a way that's as friendly as possible to the program. That'll be a kind of a current theme here. So far, so good? OK. Um, so uh, last piece of uh, setup is to do with vocabulary. I'm going to use concurrency to mean, uh, in the same way that Robert Verding uh, used in his talk uh, yesterday about Erlang, concurrency means something to do with the, the problem, right? So it's when the structure of your problem is naturally concurrent. So, you know, web servers say when it's natural to spawn off a thread to handle each client, but it doesn't really interact with the others, is a good example. Parallelism, on the other hand, is to do with um, when, when you're after performance, right? And so you, the structure of your problem would be perfectly fine on a sequential machine. You're trying to invert a matrix or something, but uh, you're, you're using a parallel machine because you want it to go fast. Make sense? Now, of course, you can write a concurrent program and run it on a parallel machine to get more performance. That's fine, too. Right? But it makes, for a concurrent program, it makes also sense to work on a sequential machine. OK? All right. So <clears throat> um, in the end, then, uh, we're going to have lots of different approaches to writing um, parallel programs. And what I'd like to do 
is not to force you to make an upfront choice about your programming mechanism by saying, which language shall I use? You know, shall I use Erlang or shall I use Haskell or shall I use F Sharp? You know, I'd rather not make that the sort of high order bit. First you decide that, now you've fixed on one parallelism paradigm, but then you might later discover that your particular problem was more suited for another or that your particular application needed some message passing stuff and some data parallel stuff. So. Um, say. So the goal, you know, our plan for world domination in Haskell is to make a sort of single linguistic framework that somehow allows you to use different programming paradigms for programming parallel computations in the same language. And my goal in this talk is to give you a kind of lightning tour of various things that we're trying out by way of programming parallel algorithms in Haskell, to give you a flavor of how they might, they might look and then how they might look differently to programmers. Okay? All right. So much for the setup. So here's a roadmap for the talk. So here we want to program parallel computers. We've decided to use Haskell. What are we going to do? Three forms of parallelism I want to describe briefly. One is I'll call task parallelism completely explicit. So this is where the threads that you spawn are completely explicit. You spawn them and you must do so because they're going to do input output. Sort of web servers, a classic example. You know, it's part of the specification that each thread is doing input output concurrency. It's by design non-deterministic. You have many program counters and you need some way of synchronizing the threads. In the middle here, semi-implicit parallelism is where you want where the, the, um, you are just going for parallelism, not concurrency, and you just want the program to run faster. So ideally, you'd like to write just a functional computation, and you'd like to exploit the natural parallelism of the functional stuff. Um, and data parallelism over here is when, you, when we're going to try to exploit massive parallelism across data structures. I'll say more about each of these coming up, but that's just the roadmap. Okay? So I'm going to start, with, start on the left here with task parallelism. Because uh, this, is, this, is looks, this is rather imperative, actually. It's not very uh, uh, functional, apparently, but it'll, um, it's a good place to start, but it's perhaps more familiar. Um. OK, so the setup is lots of threads, each performing input-output. It's non-deterministic by design. Right? So the different threads might do different things. They, they're receiving input from different places. The second, when you run the program again, it's going to do something different than it did this time by design. Um, and so you need very lightweight threads and some means for the threads to communicate with each other and share data with each other. Um, <clears throat> so, what are we going to get? Very lightweight threads. So this is the Erlang story, right? A thread shouldn't be something that you can, shouldn't just be able to have a few hundred threads. You should be, have, be able to have millions of threads. So uh, uh, the model in Haskell is, is the sort of green thread model, same, same as in Erlang. You just have lots of threads and they're very, very cheap. And they can all, they can all be doing I.O. as well. So the Haskell runtime is pretty good about making sure that if you've got lots of, if you've got thousands of open I.O. calls, uh, it won't sort of um, make your system uh, slow down too much. You just have lots of threads that are blocked on different, different I.O. They, um, they don't block OS threads. We don't take one OS thread per, per thread, of course. They share memory, and they coordinate through transactional memory. And I'm going to show you just a little bit about how that looks in Haskell. I'm sure you've heard of transactional memory, and this is just to, just to show you how it, how it plays out in Haskell. But to do, have, to do this, I have to tell you a little bit about how we do I.O. in Haskell. Just like I'd, uh, So this is a, uh, a quick reprise of yesterday's um, stuff about input-output. Right, so this is the way you're an, imp an imperative input-output performing program might look. What does it do? This says, print the string. Well, it prints say, with the reverse of yes, and then prints no. Um, and how does it work? Well, the, the, look at the type. So reverse um, of yes is, uh, has type string, so that doesn't have any side effects. But puts true of no, remember, puts true of no, this is a, a computation, one of those I.O. performing things. So it has type I.O. units. So it has some effects. And main, remember, has type I.O. unit. So this is... Um, <clears throat> And this do notation allows you to string together things that perform I.O. OK? Now let's go to concurrency. Hello. Hello. Wake up, little system. There we are. Good. Actually, we're not going to do concurrency. We're going to do internal side effects. So if you're going to share stuff between threads, you need to have some kind of mutable cells. Now, of course, in an imperative language, you're used to everything being mutable. But remember, in a functional language, all these variables that we have, you know, if you say lambda x dot blah, then x is immutable. It's just a name for a value. So we need a different weight mechanism to have a name for a mutable location. So here it is. Here's the little API. So new ref takes a value and has a side effect. That is the side effect of constructing a new mutable cell. And it returns what? A reference to the cell. So think of a ref A as a pointer to a mutable location, you know, heap allocated in the heap, a mutable location containing a value of type A, right? So it's an address. So then read takes an address, a pointer to a cell, 
reads it. That's a side-effecting operation because that is, it has the side effect of reading. It's important to, for those not to commute with writes, for example. So it's a side effect in that sense. Uh, and it returns you the contents of the cell and write takes a reference, a pointer to the cell, and a new value to put in it, puts it in it and returns unit. Okay? But does that make sense? Any, any, any questions at this stage just about the, the type signatures of these functions? I should be very sad if nobody asked questions at all in this talk. So it would be, be uh, reassuring to me if you did. But I'm hoping this is, this is fairly straightforward. So here's a little program. What, so here's Incar. Incar takes a reference. That's this R guy. So it takes a pointer to a cell containing an int, and it's going to add one to it. So what does it do? Reads R to get its contents. That's V. And then writes into R V plus 1. So you can see what I mean about uh, X plus plus, or uh, what's the word? R plus plus would be a lot shorter. But as I said yesterday, R plus plus is too short, right? This is a little bit clumsy, and that encourages you not to use it until you need to. So here's um, main. What does it do? It makes a new cell containing zero, calls incar, reads the contents of the thing, and prints it. So far, so good? So you can just read it like C at this stage, slightly clumsy C. All right. But remember, you can't say R plus 6. Why not? Because R is a reference, and you could, that would mean adding a reference to an int, and that would be ill-typed. So the type system prevents you from forgetting to do the read, right? It's precisely the read that goes from refs to A's. All right? Okay, so now to concurrency. Um, uh, where are we? So we're going to spawn thread. So this is the equivalent of spawn in Erlang. Spawn's a lightweight thread. And what do we spawn? So fork here takes um, a computation. So it's going to take one of these I.O. performing things, Spawn it off in a little thread by itself, so it's now going to run independently and return a thread ID for it. So my web server here might be written like this. It takes some kind of request port P, and what, accept a request from P, and then spawn off, or fork, something to service requests from this connection. And then what's this? Web server P. Oh, that's this guy. So that just means tail call the web server. So we go back to the start, and so we're now ready to accept a new request. Does that make sense? So this, just, this is just the outer loop that spawns a, a thread to deal with every, every um, and, and then the service request just gets a particular connection from, uh, that was passed to it here and does whatever it does and then dies. Okay? Right. Now, uh, let's see. What might go wrong? Well, here's something that might go wrong. Uh, if we uh, have one of these references here, um, we called incar. So here I've done something that's, that's a, kind, a kind of tiny, this is the obvious version of the first race hazard you come across when you do uh, you know, concurrent programming 101. New ref, and then I'll spawn a thread that does incar, and I'll call incar myself. This is spawn, as it were, spawns in immediately, in, and immediately you carry on. So now there's two threads, both calling incar. What can go wrong? Obviously, they can both read and then both write, and you lose the increment. Okay? So what are we going to do? Uh, well, we could do locks and condition variables. That's the standard solution, right? Um, and I don't think you will need reminding about the dangers of locks and condition variables. Um, <clears throat> though this last one is actually less, obvious, uh, less often mentioned. Error recovery is particularly awkward. You take several locks, and you maybe have you know, diddled with some condition variables, and then something goes wrong. So now in your exception handlers, you need to release the locks in the right way. And that can be very difficult to get right. And if you screw up there, um, then things are bad. And furthermore, this happens in something that's not on the critical path of your code. So it's harder to test. So it's, well, I don't need to tell you. OK, so, um, so this is all bad. But in fact, locks and condition variables are kind of even worse in that some problems are really rather difficult to write. Here's a, a, um, an example of a double-ended queue, right? So you, which you're trying to insert items at, at uh, either end of the queue. And uh, you can have one lock to protect the whole queue, but that's not very concurrent. So it's kind of neater if you have one lock per sort of queue element here. And then you can be inserting at one end while you're taking out the other end. That's kind of cool, right? Nice and concurrent, no, no sort of central point of failure. But when the, li when the list gets short, right, then they're diddling with the same cell, and then things get really difficult. And as you probably, probably know here, if you want to write a double-ended queue for a sequential um, program. It's uh, pretty easy, right? It's kind of undergraduate stuff, or maybe even school stuff. Um, if you want to write one of these guys uh, with a lock per cell, it isn't anymore a publishable result, but it used to be. Right? You could actually get conference papers <laughs> about this problem or variants of this problem. People will publish a conference paper about this, then, then they say, oh, but if you want to also be able to delete right, at the same time, that could be happening as well. Their new paper, there's a sort of paper factory for that. It was amazing. Um, um, 
It's difficult. So this is an incredibly, incredible step function, right? It tells you something about concurrency, that you can go from undergraduate project to research result in, uh, just, just by saying, oh, and I'd like to do this at the same time. So uh, transactional memory. How many of you have actually written a pro any programs involving transactional memory? Um, kind of just a handful. But I guess most of you have heard about it, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're just going to have a quick look at what it looks like in Haskell. So, um, oh, but the point about transactional memory just takes you back to the undergraduate case. Because what do you do? You just say, uh, if you've got some side effect, some side effect in code, you just say atomically, blur. And you just, the blur is the code that modifies the queue. Um, so, to a first approximation, then you're just going to write the sequential code and wrap atomically around it. And you, what do you get? You get, uh, you get the sort of A and I of the acid stuff of, of uh, transactions. It's atomic and it's isolated. It's not durable. Um, and the really nice thing is that uh, you can't deadlock. Why can't you deadlock? There are no locks. How could you deadlock if there are no locks? Isn't that amazing? Uh, so this is the way to solve problems, is by, by defining them out of existence. Right? <laughs> this is the best way to solve a problem. And error recovery is great, right? If deep in the middle of a transaction, when you've modified things and you're, you know, you're sort of deep in the engine room and you divide by zero, blam! You just pop out of the transaction and abandon it entirely. And since we have to be able to do that, all the infrastructure must be there, right? Error recovery is just beautiful. Just the transaction is as if it never happened. And you don't need to remember to do anything. To me, that, that, that's incredible benefit. So, uh, how does it look specifically in Haskell? Well, remember, oh, yes, question. Oh, how nice, thank you. If you do bomb out in one of your atomic um, blocks, um, do you just try again? Oh, good question. So the question is, yeah. So the question is, if you have an exception in the middle of an atomic block, what happens? Do you bomb out and then just retry, or do you do something else? So if it's so, there are two sorts of things that can go wrong in a transaction. One is you might divide by zero, so something really might go wrong. In which case, the semantics that we've implemented for for the Haskell transactions is, you bomb out of the transaction and make it as if you had never started it, and then you keep propagating the exception. So this whole I.O. monad stuff that I've been showing you has an exception semantics too. Now there's another way in which a transaction might go wrong, which is you get to the end, and the implementation tries to commit, but it finds that some other thread has been messing with that same data, in which case that's not really anything wrong with your program. It's just that, right, in that case, you just, just go back to the beginning and retries. And presumably, you need to have a limit on the number of times that you retry. So atomic, uh, transactional memory, like every other concurrency paradigm, is not a single bullet, silver bullet, yes. So a long-running transaction might get repeatedly bumped by short-running transactions, because every time it gets to the end, it's like the librarian trying to reorganize the library. You know, if they reorganize the library, a big long transaction, and then uh, you know, one borrower comes along and takes out one book, right? they have to, oh, I've got to start again with reorganizing the library. Right? Now, there is no automatic solution for that. Right? You, the programmer needs to get involved somehow. So you need some kind of anti-starvation mechanism, which eventually says, I we try this too often, I'll throw an exception that says, and actually, we've not implemented that part, because I don't think we've got enough people um, that have, for which that's been a problem yet. But that would be the natural thing to do. Thank you. Any, any, any other questions? Yes. Yes. So. No, you've got to switch it on, though. Oh. Yeah. Ah, power, power up. Sorry, it's obviously not running Haskell. Um, so if you, if you divide by zero in the middle yeah. of your thing, you said that it rolls back. Yeah. Is there any way of getting access to what the state was when it was happening? No, you don't get access to what the state was at that moment, but you can, you can uh, include a value with the exception that's, that's thrown out. So you can sort of include some breadcrumbs that would tell you. But, but yeah, you don't, you don't sort of, you can't sit there and look, look at exactly the way the state was because we've thrown it all away. So. Um, I suspect one day that will become a problem too, and debuggers will want to look at it. Okay, we're good to go? Do they compose? Ah, ah, I'm so glad you asked that. Can you just hold it for about, <laughs> ten, about, about two minutes? Oh, how are we doing? Oh, I forgot to start my stopwatch. You're going to just keep, keep me, keep me, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but we have a lot, a lot more to say. Oh, dear, 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 dear. This is very exciting. Um, now, uh, don't get me going. This is, <laughs> you'll be here all afternoon. Right. Um, now. Uh, before, just before we get to composition, let me remark that. This atomically thing, right, so atomically has type IOA to IOA, so it has a similar kind of type as fork did. It takes a computation as an argument. It's not a language construct, it's just a function. Its implementation is a bit magic, 
but fundamentally it's just a function. You can even pass atomically as an argument to something if you like. It's just a value with this type. Now here, so I'm going to call four guys atomically in car, and they'll do this guy atomically, and now everything will be fine for my thing. But you might think, what if I had forgotten one of these atomicallys, right? So I just called in car all by itself, right? Without being wrapped in atomically, that would be bad, right? Because I want to make sure that I don't. I, I, yeah, what's to stop you do, writing the original program, the one that we had back here? Oh, dear, I shouldn't have done this, should I? Uh, come back, come back. Um, uh, what happens if I wrote this program by mistake, right? Uh, well, the nice thing is that we can, just by making a simple change to the type of atomically, we can prevent you doing that completely by construction. Here it is. So atomically now, instead of having type IOA to IOA, it has type, uh, uh, go, STMA, to IOA. What's STM? It's a different and weaker monad. It's a different and weaker little side effect in computation. So in this S, so we got these new TVAR, read TVAR, and write, they're like those IO ref things. I don't know why we call them TVARs rather than TREFs, but there you go. They're TVAR, transactional variables, right? And so they have the same signatures as new read and write did before. But now um, inc t here uh, has type TVAR to STM unit, and so I can't call inc t from the I.O. world, right? Because if I was to call it from main, if I was to call inc t directly, main is expecting an I.O. thing, and inc t is an STM thing, so type error. The only way I can call inc t is by making it an argument of atomically. Does that make sense? So I cannot call inc t except by putting it inside an atomic. So that's really good, because it means that I can't screw up by forgetting to wrap the atomic sellotape around things that should be atomic. So that's great. Uh, now, um, more stuff that you can't do. You can't, how could, these T-Vars, now I've got them, uh, it would be a bit bad if I could take one of these T-Vars and fiddle with it outside uh, an STM thing. But I can't do that either, right? Because, well, we've just seen, the only way I can fiddle with a T-Var is with one of these functions, and they generate STM things, and I can't do anything with an STM thing outside, uh, uh, outside the STM stuff. But the other thing is, I can't do input-output inside a transaction. Imagine inside the transaction I said, uh, you know, read and write some transactional variables and then launch the missiles. We discussed this last night, right? And if you want to retry the transaction, you'd launch the missiles again, which would be bad, right? Or if you, if you discovered the transaction shouldn't have happened at all. So um, we want to not be able to do I.O. inside a transaction. And again, the type here tells you that because the argument of atomically, that should have say atomically, right, this guy here, can only do uh, these read and write things. It can't do I.O. It's a kind of very weak side effect, like, in, you know, in, inside atomic transactions, you can only do simple things. Does that make sense? So that's really good. It sort of limits you uh, what you can do. Um, and to return to, to return to your question, the best thing of all is it composes really well. So here is, uh, let's see, there was inc t, right? And here's inc t2 that calls inc t twice. And inc t2 is just another STM thing, right? So I can... I can sort of imagine I can build little bigger STM things by gluing together smaller STM things, as big as I like, and then finally when I've got a nice, nice thing that I want to run atomically, I wrap the atomic sellotape around it, and blam, that runs as a transaction. So for example, if I had um, STM things that inserted something into one queue and removed things from another, I could call atomically insert into one, remove in the other, and I'd know that that, that, was, well, that was all that uh, could happen. They'd have to happen atomically or not at all. So it composes beautifully, and that's... That's the, um, that's a really nice thing. Uh, right. Okay. Enough for atomic stuff. I just want to, um, uh, inco there's, a, there's a paper about this uh, up here on my homepage. Um, the, the thing that I haven't had, I haven't got time to tell you about, but I would adore to, is about uh, retry and all else. These were the things that, uh, that once we'd learned how to imitate transactional memory in Haskell, we found that, um, we found these two new combinators that deal with blocking and choice inside transactions that make transactions way more powerful. This is the equivalent of a condition variable, but amazingly beautiful condition variable. I mean, it's a condition variable that makes it so much... Ah, oh, I don't know. You have to read the paper. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's easy reading, too. You, 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 you'll read it in the bath. Um, let me... Um, <clears throat> Let me uh, just remark, so in this talk I wanted to, um, 
to just try to give you a sense that this is not just uh, sort of pointy-headed academic stuff. The people are actually using this for real, real stuff. Here's a, there's some bunch of people. I don't know where they are. They had this web server called Warp, which is part of a web framework called Yesod. Uh, right, and I don't even know what, uh, what optimized static file serving is and request bodies to be processing on. I don't know what all this stuff is. But, but nevertheless, and what is a slow Loris attack? You know this. I don't. But anyway, so it's a short, very short right, um, uh, little web server. And, um, uh, but they, get, they sent me some um, performance numbers for this. So these are, these are apparently, you, do, you, you may know what Goliath is and Tornado. Have you heard of these? No? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so there they are. They're, they're, they're web servers of some kind. So Warp, curiously, is really, even though it's written in Haskell with this very high concurrency stuff, is really very, very fast. Uh, yes, or it's sort of closely related to your. This is another Haskell one. This is another Haskell one. This is Node.js, I think. Right? So it's sort of, it's in there. But... Uh, so this is looking good, but it's kind of, this is kind of a small-ish example. Maybe it's a bit artificial. I can't really tell you because I don't know enough about it. Um, here's a rather larger one. So this is some, a BitTorrent client um, or BitTorrent implementation or something. Uh, so it's a bit bigger, right? 5,000 odd lines of code. Um, and it really does use STM a lot. It's, it's all coordinated using STM. And uh, let's see. Uh, and it uses quite a lot of threads. So there's a few hundred threads going on in this thing. So these here, I think, uh, what's this? Lines of code. This is not performance. So on this graph, uh, small is good, right? And so these guys are, I can't read them myself. Um, R torrent and K torrent and transmission deluge. Deluge. Anyway, so this is, <laughs> this is an Erlang one and this is a Haskell one. And I have no idea what this Wugo, I don't know quite what, what that is. But, but the message I take away for this is that it was pretty small. Um, and they tell me, it, so here, I don't think they have the same, it goes faster than anybody else, but apparently it's respectable. So there's a URL, all these slides will be available, you can chase it down if you want. Okay, enough on uh, concurrency, that was, that's the, so that's in a way the part that's uh, kind of most um, familiar, sort of shared memory concurrency stuff. Right, how are we doing, how long, how long have we had? What? 20 minutes. 20 minutes left? Oh, we'll have to go faster. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, speed up, speed up. <laughs> when you are envious of somebody, the best thing to do is to imitate. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. For a long time, I wanted to uh, uh, imitate Erlang, because Erlang's wildly successful in this, this uh, message passing niche. So, uh, you know, we're going to have processes with um, uh, channels that pass message messages between them. It's just in, the, in this sort of, for the Erlang kind of application, which is rather different than this sort of shared memory interaction application, brilliant. Just want to set, show, what is that going to look like in Haskell? Oh, beg your pardon, just to mention, the main thing about Erlang I discovered after uh, talking to Joe is not so much the message passing idea, which after all has been around for years and years, ever since actors and, um, oh, ah, oh, forgotten the name of the guy in MIT. I oh, should, he's suddenly gone blank. Um, is the failure model, right? Erlang has really good mechanisms for linking processes together so that if one dies, then the sort of master process can respond by starting up new copies and so forth. So Erlang's sort of fail fast idea is key to this very, very high reliability. So we just want to steal all that and replicate it in Haskell as, guess what, a library, right? So here's what the, the API looks like. Now, it's not quite like Erlang in that just like Dart's isolates, we're going to have typed... Uh, ch p uh, channels. So rather than each process having one input port, we're going to be able to make you make, uh, have lots of ports and send, send messages over them. So new channel gives you, so it works in a yet another monad, right? So it's, now, it's still a bit side effect. We're still going to be sending messages. It's PM for the process monad, and you get a send end and a receive end, send port and receive port. And then we're going to be able to, if we've got a send port and a value of type A, we're going to be able to send it. Sorry, that should say PM unit. Receive, we're going to take a receive port and get back a value of type A. So it's very straightforward. Right? Um, just the kind of thing that you'd expect. But notice that the bits that you have, these blue things, are the things that correspond to an Erlang process or a Dart isolate. But each of these blue things is itself a shared memory, multi-threaded, concurrent Haskell thing, just like we've been discussing. So everything we just discussed now is going to happen within one of these guys, but between them, they send messages. All right, you might think, but what if I sent a message containing one of those T-bars? Then you could have a guy here and a guy here trying to do a transactional memory thing on the same transactional variable. Now, you could say, well, the infrastructure should just do the right thing and do a cross-planet transaction. <laughs> Bad idea. Remember the cost model stuff, right? We want to make sure that transactions, if they're going to have a decent cost model, it's got to be physically local. So we'd like to not let you send T-bars. Ah! 
but we have the perfect mechanism for stopping you. Look, look at the types. Send only works on things that are serializable. So all we need to do is to refrain from making tvar into an instance of the serializable class that we discussed yesterday, right? So rather than serialization being built into the infrastructure by making it part of the sort of uh, the program accessible language infrastructure, we let you uh, avoid sending tvars, and that's good. And we also let you, we, we prevent you from sending send ports, right? So you can send, oh, beg your pardon. Um, we, you can send the send end of a channel to somebody else, but you can't send the receive end. What does that mean? It means the receive end stays at its birthplace, while the send end can migrate to other places and be passed around to messages and so that many people can have sends end, but it, they all know where to send because it, it's very important that the birthplace doesn't move. Otherwise, again, the cost model goes to hell again. Because if, you know, if I send the send end to you and the receive end to you and then you send, where does it, where does it go? Ah, uh, maybe via me, and that's bad because I might have died by now. Who knows what? Anyway. All right. All right. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip it. So uh, I didn't want to say uh, much more than to say this, again, is at a fairly prototypical stage in our, um, um, in our implementation of Haskell. Well, there is something called Cloud Haskell now, and it, is capable of re it really is capable of doing these kind of distributed parallel algorithms. On, uh, this, this was on an Amazon cluster, I think. Yes, there's an Amazon EC2. This was a, a master's project. Um, so it sort of started to creep into real life. This is good. So it's fairly recent. OK. So. Um, uh, you might wonder about uh, why uh, everything I've said so far is rather imperative, right? I thought we were talking about functional languages here. And uh, yeah, that's kind of true. But um, it's, there's still quite a large functional component here. I've concentrated on the concurrency support. But in any concurrent program, there's lots of just computation to do, right? And the fact that it's a bit inconvenient to do this stuff guides you, pushes you quite hard, actually, towards making the stuff that doesn't is, is only that is not necessarily mutating. It strongly encourages you to do that in a functional style, and then we don't need to track anything. And, it, and it's very, this is very good for efficiency. The reason that STM works out really well for Haskell, but did not work out for .NET, say, is because you only mutate it, or the, the STM is only tracking those read TVARs and write TVARs. There's a zillion other memory operations going, as you're doing functional computation, reversing lists and traversing trees. All of that involves memory operations, none of which are tracked by the transactional memory logging mechanism. Right? So it's really good for efficiency that we're being, um, what's the word, parsimonious about side effects. All right? OK, onward. Semi-implicit parallelism, very briefly. Uh, here is a, uh, an algorithm for um, uh, solving the N queens problem. Now, actually, I think given, the, uh, um, <clears throat> given our state of being time-wise, I'm not going to explain this algorithm uh, uh, at all. I'm just going to show you a picture. So this is the usual kind of thing if you're trying to uh, you know, place queens on a board such that they don't attack each other. You start with an empty board, and you put you know, a queen in column one or column two or column three, and then you see if you can place one more and then one more, and then you cross out ones where they attack each other. Right? That's all that's going on. Now, so here's the, uh, the code. So this now is a purely functional algorithm. There's no side effects in here anywhere. How do we make it work in parallel? Well, look at this map here. That map is saying, do the subtree algorithm for each of the children of this node. So in a picture here, each of these nodes, ah, drat, each of these nodes has children here. And we want to do the same algorithm on each subtree. So it's natural just to say, spawn a thread for each of those sub guys, right? So, uh, here, if we just turn this map into a par map, well, we've made the algorithm run in parallel. Um, and in fact, this particular program really does work in parallel. So if you've got a six-core machine, it goes three and a half times as fast. You don't need to get a special version of the compiler. This is just the one that comes out of the box. Now, you might think, three and a half times as fast on six cores, that's not very cool, right? What, what about six times as fast, please? But remember, this was three and a half times as fast for a six-character change to your program. That's not so bad, right? And did you have to buy those cores specially? No, no, they were there idle anyway. So this is the, here the name of the game is trying to get you a you know, respectable improvement in performance for quite modest investment of programmer time on cores that you're otherwise not really using um, at all. Um, so and the other thing that's really important to note is that the result is deterministic. If you change that map to par map, you know that 
you're going to get the same answer every time. If you run the program today and tomorrow and the next day, it's always going to give you the same answer as it gave you on the sequential machine. It's not going to give you different answers on different days. Debugging those kind of, uh, those kind of concurrency errors on uh, parallel machines is really very painful. So if you get that kind of concurrency error, you know, it prints three one day and four the next, it's my fault, not your fault. That's a great feeling, except that, of course, it still doesn't work. But, no, but, but actually... <laughs> Uh, this usually does work, right? So, so this implementation is fairly solid. It really does give the same answer every day. Okay, so um, uh, what to say about that? So that's the good thing about it. The good thing about it is it's fairly low effort, and you get modest speed-ups um, on um, you know, regularly available multi-core machines. The bad thing is that it can be a bit difficult to get... Uh, uh, the, the cost model straight, because what's happening is that map, remember, is taking place at every level of a tree. So sometimes you're calling, you're spawning little subcomputations on very, very tiny computations, so the granularity is not very good. And the locality, well, don't even think about it. There's pointers going around all over the heap, right? So it's sort of good for shared memory things, but it's not very good for getting locality. So granularity can be a bit of a problem. Uh, profiling tools, though, can help quite a bit with this. So we've got this parallel profiling tool that lets you see things like, oh my goodness, here nothing much is happening. At least only one thread seems to be active. What's going on? So you need to get performance. If you want to make a parallel program run fast, you need to have some insight into what's going on. So we started to develop t tools to, to, um, uh, to do that. Okay. So um, the main message here is, I think, this is not a story for uh, 10,000 processor machines. It's the story for shared memory multi-cores that you've kind of got anywhere where, where um, a bit of speed up of you know, a factor of three or five or eight might be quite helpful to you. It can make really quite a big difference, as it did for this guy. This guy is a guy called John Ramsdell, and he was, he's doing cryptographic analysis at the MITRE Corporation. And he has this 6,500 line Haskell program that does, I don't know what it is, something to do with crypto something, CPSA. Protocol Shapes Analyzer. I don't know what this is. But anyway, he, uh, uh, his remark was that the reason he wrote it in Haskell was not primarily for parallelism. It's because it's quite a mathematical algorithm, and it transcribed very directly into Haskell. And then with one call to Parmat, as it happened, just the same as, as this example I just showed you, again, he got a, a sort of three, and a half, three times speed up on his quad core. And when his problems took a day to run, that three times speed up was save a saving of 16 hours on every run. So that was quite worthwhile for him. Uh, now, it wasn't all joy, right? He did have to think about changing his algorithm a bit. He didn't just take his original program and sort of make a one-line change. He had to sort of rejig his algorithm a bit so that there was a map at the key place that he could turn into a PAR map. There's no getting around that. You have to write a parallel algorithm, okay? Um, but it was kind of worthwhile. Now, ugh, this battery on this thing must be running out. Quick go on data parallels, and we have? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, good. That's more than we need. Oh, that's right. All right, all right, all right. I'll, I'll try. Deep breathing. <laughs> it's so exciting. Now, if you want to program, I've been stressing this stuff about um, that you can, uh, the, that this semi-implicit stuff is good for modest numbers of cores. And I really think the same is true for the explicit parallelism that I was talking about. If you're going to be spawning threads, right, explicitly, uh, then you've got lots of program counters to think about and lots of synchronization to think about. And for, you know, a few dozen threads or, or maybe a few... You could have hundreds of threads if they're really all the same, right? But if there's... Um, uh, if they're all doing different things, then it gets to be pretty hard to think about the synchronization. So I think if you really want to occupy a big machine, you have to think differently. And I think there you have to think in terms of data parallelism. So what do I mean by data parallelism? So there's two main stories for data parallel. One is flat data parallel, and the other is nested data parallel. So what does flat mean? Uh, so flat is the brand leader. We've had it for 30 years. It means if you've got an aggregate of data, a collection, let's say an array, and let's say it contains just you know, something simple like floating point numbers, but it's really big, like 100 million elements in it, and you want to, then you want to have a parallel for loop that does something to each element. The something that you're going to do to each element is fairly small and probably sequential. All right. Now, so you say something like, for all i in 1 to n, do something to AI. Now, the nice thing about this is that we have a very efficient way to implement it. You take the big array of 100 million elements. If you've got, let's say, 1,000 processors, you put 100,000 elements on each processor. You set them all off, and they each run down with a sequential loop. They don't spawn 100,000 threads, right? These little green dots are one per floating point number. You don't spawn 100,000 threads. 
you just write a sequential loop that rips down that 100,000 things in a nice, tight, you know, cash-friendly, um, register-friendly me mechanism, just runs run down thing, does the job for those 100,000, and then you have some mechanism for gathering up the results. Does that make sense? So that's really good execution model, good locality, good granularity, as in we're not sparting lots of tiny threads. Brilliant. And that's, this is why it's the brand leader. You know, uh, lots of high-performance Fortran and MPI and StarC, all of those things are based on fundamentally this kind of idea. So, um, uh, so this is good, and um, we can play a sort of similar game in Haskell. I'm just going to quickly show you how it looks. Uh, this is a face recognition algorithm actually developed in uh, NICTA in Sydney um, by my colleagues at UNSW, and but I think this, the code was actually written at NICTA. Uh, so, again, I don't really, well, this, is, this is a piece of mathematics that to do with face recognition. I don't really uh, understand exactly what it's saying, uh, but I don't need to because they wrote some Haskell to explain it. So here's a kind of data flow diagram for it. Um, so this is the same formula rendered. Now, so now you, you can, and, and mathematicians are happy to do this, right? They see, see their maths as a kind of data flowy thing. So here's the same data flow picture at the top, and here it is rendered into Haskell. So look what's happening. Distances takes two, uh, two arrays. Um, this is a two-dimensional array. This is a three-dimensional array. They both contain floating point numbers. And it's returning a one-dimensional array. So here are the two arrays as the arguments. And I'm, here's dists is the result. So dists down here is the result. And what does it look like? Well, dists here, that's the result over here. It was the result of applying something, a map, to every element of some other. So map divide by r over reg sum. So it's just, and what's reg sum? It's reduced. So that's with this reduced thing was a kind of collapse along one dimension of the vector. So that's the reduce by, um, of L1 norm, whatever that is. And L1 norm itself was a reduce along another dimension. And so I think you can see pretty quickly that this code here is simply a textual rendering of this picture. Do, does, does that make sense? It kind of at an intuitive level. So we're programming at the array level with arrays as first class values. This is not a new idea, right? This goes back, uh, way, way back, um, uh, certainly to APL and before, and, and various Fortran's have offered arrays as first class values. So in, in some sense, the, the new stuff here, this is a, a paper called REPA, or a li Haskell library called REPA. The new stuff here is that you get a very nice degree of array polymorphism that I don't have um, time to show you about, where you can write out functions that are, don't just work on two-dimensional arrays, but work on any dimensional arrays higher than two, say, or, uh, or so, so that somehow the functions that you write can be polymorphic over something to do with the shape of the array. Um, so you get more reuse that way. Um, that can work quite nicely. So, uh, so here is, here's the, there's a link again in the, in the slides to the... Um, uh, to the, the, the paper and, a, and a, some blog posts about it. Uh, REPA is a library that quite a lot of people are using now. Well, you should take these numbers with a dose of salt. But what happens here? So this is uh, matrix multiply Laplace and fast Fourier transform versus GCC, right? So, and this is one thread. You can't really see this at the back. What is GCC? 53 seconds. Uh, one thread on one processor, 92 seconds. So that's not so great. So we're taking twice as long for matrix multiply as we did in C. Ah, for me, I think that's pretty amazing, right? This is Haskell code, and we're only going twice as slow as C. But when you run it on this multiprocessor machine that they were running at, uh, they had quite a lot of processors. It went down to 2.4 seconds. So that's quite worthwhile, right? Because it's not, not so easy to parallelize this GCC version. Uh, Laplace was kind of similar, not so dramatic. 6.5 seconds we started in GCC, 32 seconds in Haskell. Oh my, that's five times slower. But on their big machine, it went down to 3.8 seconds, which is a bit faster. Now, this is fast Fourier transform. 2.4 seconds in GCC, 98 seconds in Haskell. Oh my, right? Much, much slower. But FFT is something that's been optimized like crazy in um, you know, good FFT algorithms for in C libraries are fantastically good at doing fast Fourier transform. And we don't even get near to the 2.4 seconds. This is 7.7 .7 for those of you sitting at the back. But, you know, so there's a little way to go yet. So the, the, all that you can take away from this slide is it's possible to write algorithms that work over dense arrays in a rather high-level style, right, like this, whoops, a rather high-level style like this, and get performance which is not out of, you know, which is which not out of the box crazy compared to what you can get with um, uh, conventional imperative languages. And so just being in, this, in the same ballpark is good. Being able to parallelize a bit and get some speed up is even better. And you might think, oh, these data parallel things, what about... G GPUs, right? All these uh, things that were all the flavor of the month. GPUs, massively parallel, floating point intensive stuff. Wouldn't it be great to exploit a GPU? So here's what you do. You take this, the program that we saw 
and you just add this ACK thing in front, and the, the code here is unchanged. Oh, and now it runs on a GPU. So all we did is change the types. We didn't change the code. What's going on? So the idea is that, um, uh, what's the idea? Uh, oh, how, does, how can this work at all? Well, uh, the way it works at all is because these pluses and minuses here, instead of working over floats, they're now working over acts of floats. So we're, we're, um, we're making use of the fact that plus will work over any numeric type. So including a numeric type that is a syntax tree. Right? So if you imagine plus working over numbers, it adds them. What does plus working of a syntax tree do? It just builds a bigger syntax tree. So the idea is that uh, if you have a computation of type ACK array AB, which is what's returned here, what distances returns is an ACK thing. What is an ACK thing? It's a syntax tree built out of all this stuff, and we then give it to CUDA.run that takes that syntax tree and munges it and munges it and turns it into CUDA, which gets compiled, which puts in the GPU and runs. Right? So it's kind of nice that you can... This is what I meant yesterday when I said about Haskell being a good host for a domain-specific language. In effect, what we built here is a domain-specific language for programming GPUs. It, uh, only, it, you can only run on the GPU something that is of type ACK something, so only ACK-like functions will work, but there are going to be enough of them, of you know, these numeric ones, to program GPUs with. Right? But you're not going to be able to do list reverse on the GPU because it doesn't have an ACK type. Does that make sense? So again, the types tell you what you can do where, just like they did for the STM thing. Um, but for these domain-specific sub-languages, like the domain-specific language of GPU stuff, all of which has an ACK in front of it, then you can get good performance guarantees because you know that that will compile for the GPU and will run fast because that's the way the library's built. So this is a library called Accelerate. It's actually built by um, Manuel Chakravarti and his colleagues at the University of New South Wales uh, in Sydney. Uh, okay. Uh, enough said. Right. <clears throat> and we're uh, sort of five minutes? Seven. 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 Good. Okay. All right. Um, so... Accelerate is Manuel's project, but there are, this is an area where I think things are still developing. So at uh, Chalmers, where John Hughes is from, there's this uh, project called Feldspar, um, and under, in sort of deep inside Feldspar is a little domain-specific embedded language in Haskell called Obsidian. It, too, is a language for programming GPUs in a domain-specific way. So by having it not built into Haskell, but rather programmed as a library expressed in Haskell, we give lots of space for experimenting. So this is a very active area at the moment. I should just mention, since I work for Microsoft, that Microsoft also has this quite nice accelerator library for .NET, which works in a rather similar way. That is, you write expressions which generate syntax trees, and when you say, like I said, cuda.run, there's an equivalent thing in accelerator, so in accelerator, yes, which takes the, this kind of syntax tree and runs it on, on GPUs. So you can do this in, in .NET as well. Um, but Haskell is nicer. I didn't say that. <laughs> right, last very quick thing then, nested data parallelism. So this is the, um, I'm going to say least about this because it's uh, most ambitious and because it's the, the, the end of the talk. But here's the idea, and it's not my idea, it's Guy Blalock's idea. One of the awkward things about flat data parallelism, the stuff we've been looking at so far, is that it's, well, flat. So you might want to write an algorithm that, does, that, that works over an aggregate for i equals 1 to n, do something to each AI, whether something now is a parallel algorithm, in fact, a data parallel algorithm. That is, it has more of these for each's inside it. So now the, the parallelism tree looks like this. You might have sort of more modest branching factor, and then each of those branch, and each of those branch. And furthermore, it might not be very balanced, right? So the tree gets to be kind of um, unbalanced and a bit bushy in some places and not very much in others. Now, remember what I said about the cost model, this business about dividing up the data equally across the processes and then just running sequential code down them? That's not going to work anymore in this. Because if I just divided, supposing I had, even if I had three processes, if I divided at the top, this, process, this middle processor would be very idle. It doesn't have very much to do. This guy would be very busy and this guy would be in the middle. Not so cool, right? Uh, in fact, it's very difficult to get good load balancing. What people do in situations like this is they tend to spawn threads and then do dynamic work stealing. But that's not so good for locality and granularity because, then, because these leaves are very small. So what to do? 
Enter Guy Blalock. So he had this idea of, he described an, uh, in his language called Nestle, a way of transforming a nested data parallel program, that is the one here that you want to write. Oh, I should say, this, this nested stuff, this recursive, greatly increases the expressiveness. It greatly increases the range of things you can do right, in a parallel way. It's just that it's the program we want to write, but it's not the program we want to run. And what Guy showed is how to turn the program we want to write and do a compile time transformation into the program that we want to run. And it turns out people sometimes do this manually, but it's extremely difficult to do manually. So Guy described a kind of automated transformation that would do this. So, uh, so Manuel and I thought, well, hey, look, here's this, this, this stuff Nestle developed in the 90s. Nobody has actually built a, you know, a usable Nestle implementation or, or an implementation of nested data parallelism. We should just add that to this multi-paradigm sort of parallel Haskell armory. So the $1,000 note is sitting on the pavement. Let's just pick it up. Why has nobody else picked it up? Ah, so three and a half years later, we now know why nobody else picked up. <laughs> bloody hard to do this transformation, right? This, this, this thing and getting the, this resulting program to then optimize well is extremely difficult. So, um, well, there you go. This is just to say this is, I think, if we could do this and make it put a predictably perform well, it would be incredible because now you'd be able to write much more, uh, much more freely expressive programs. Um, I've got, there's a whole another talk about this, the kind of programs you can write in Data Parallel Haskell with this nested stuff and still run them fast on um, machines with, uh, with um, memory that might even not be all, all shared memory. You could start to think about distributed memory again because we have a handle on locality. So, but this is not ready for everything else I've shown you, you can use today. This you can actually use in our next release, which will be kind of around Christmas time, but I wouldn't bet your company on it yet. Okay. No, June next year, bet your company. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Uh, you can read these conclusions yourself. I, I just think that um, uh, the, I, the, the, the idea of kind of hosting multiple ways of writing uh, multiple parallelism paradigms within a single linguistic framework is important because any one application might have several different, you might want to do transactional memory for part of it and data parallelism somewhere else. I don't want that to be an upfront choice. So back to the talk I gave yesterday, I think that Haskell's a good laboratory for exploring these kind of ideas and the fact that you can mix and match is quite, quite helpful. And, the, and, and you can... You can um, uh, you can sort of run and use this stuff for the most part. Most of what I've shown you can use today. Uh, but just to say, I, I'm keen on Haskell, and, and that has perhaps become apparent. But, um, <clears throat> but these other guys are doing crazy great stuff as well. You know, Erlang, um, um, amazing language that I've learned a lot from, and um, Scala and F Sharp are doing wonderful things as well. So, but I think the, the direction of um, uh, being more declarative is where we're going to go. I think that's enough. Let's, let's have uh, questions if anybody's got any. Yeah. Um, just on the yeah. My experience with CUDA is that parallelizing the algorithm is one thing, but you get the real benefit from optimizing the memory access patterns and things like that. At this level of abstraction, do you still do that, or does it have to? Oh, so the question is, uh, what, what, once you've got your CUDA algorithm, uh, you get a lot of extra performance by optimizing memory access patterns. I haven't a clue. I'm sorry. I don't think we're there yet. I don't, I don't think that's... Well, John, John can answer. John. Optimizing the memory access patterns is an important part of making the fiddling program go faster. Oh, yeah, the microphone's coming your way. Good. You're much better. You've got to switch the microphone on, though. <laughs> that's Oh, it's affordances are insufficiently self-explanatory. <laughs> Yeah. Optimizing memory access patterns is a very important part of making Obsidian programs go fast. And so it's certainly uh, one of the things that's being looked at in developing these domain-specific languages with Haskell. So, and is that done by the program or by the Obsidian implementation? Do you know? A bit of both, I think. A bit of both, yeah. Um. <clears throat> Have we heard a little bit of this before? Because a number of years ago, we said, we'll use declarative ways of dealing with databases. We ended up with SQL. You don't need to know anything about the underlying data or structure. There's a lot of people earn a very good living by knowing about the underlying data and structure. 
Sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand. The, the, you're saying it's, it's like something you've seen before. Yeah, it's saying things are declarative and it's just all going to be taken care of that you don't really need to know about concurrency. Oh. I've heard this in right. a number so, of different so, ways. So I, I try to start by saying I don't think there's a magic bullet here. It's absolutely not the case that you just write your program in Haskell and magically it works fast. Indeed, even you know, with some of these things, you're going to write in Haskell and it's going to perform like a dog, right? Then you've got to get your profiler out and see what's going on. I, I don't think there's any system that can promise you parallelism without tiers. Absolutely not. All I want is a framework which makes it possible to get good performance. Mm -hmm. right? no, I, don't, I don't, do not know how to build a system that will guarantee to give you good performance. So I'm not making that promise. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, with the cloud Haskell. Are you able to quickly and simply explain how you deal with closures? And if you can, please do. How, uh, so say more about what you mean by how, I mean, how we implement closures at all. How, how you deal with closures being transferred across this distributed. Oh, memory. yes, right. So this in, is in the sort of cloud Haskell bit where you've got distributed, distributed memory. So the, so the difficulty there is what if you take a, um, a function value, right, and you want to send that over the network. That is the reason that we've uh, only started doing Cloud Haskell in the last year, because for the last you know, 10 previous years, I've been thinking, I don't know how to do that. Right? So the trouble with sending closures is, you can't say, if you've got a function with type A, R, O, B, it's no good if A is serializable and B is serializable. What you need is for the free variables of the function to be serializable. Right? And they're not even visible in the type. Right? So then you're back to serializing as a service, and that's not good. But what you can do is you can serialize functions that have no free variables easily, right? So now what we want to do is a way to express in the type system the idea of a function with no free variables. So if you read the, the uh, so I'll, I'll explain to you afterwards how that's done, or that we had a paper about it at uh, the Haskell workshop this year. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a little language construct that lets you formalize the notion of a function without free variables. Now, you make it possible for the programmer to say, here's, as it were, just a pure code pointer, and here it's free variables. I want to serialize all that. So it, again, it puts it all back into the region of something you can get hold of as a programmer, and therefore you can encapsulate in libraries and so forth. So we're way further forward than we were, I think. No more time. If you want to ask more questions, find him outside. Please do. Simon Payton-Jones. Great. Thanks a lot.